The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod. We're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Wednesday and you know I love Wednesdays because first we are going to have Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grampache is here with us live today. She's going to be answering your questions. And then the second hour we have Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Nancy Allspot Jackson will be here and we have a really exciting guest for you today who's going to be talking about uh, resources, excuse me, for our families that are Spanish speaking. So we'll look forward to that in the second hour. But first we're going to have Dr. Doreen Grampache. And I always want to remind you guys that this show is meant to be interactive. So you have the opportunity to ask Dr. Doreen Grampache questions. You can do that in many different ways. Emily is showing some of them to you on the screen right now. If you go to www.autism-live.com, you will see that there's a computer screen. You can click on the computer screen and watch the most recent show or the live show. And you can also go to the white box right next to that screen, put your cursor there, type whatever you would like, hit enter, and it will immediately show up on my screen. In that way, I can be asking Dr. Doreen Grampache your questions and you can be adding information. She can ask you questions and it can really be a conversation. So we hope that you will participate uh, in the conversation because that's why we're all here. So without further ado, it is time for Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen grand is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Doreen Grandpache. Dr. Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache is a visionary in the field of autism, and now you get to ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grandpache is the Dr. Doreen is an expert in autism. Dr. Grandpache. Dr. Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache. Dr. Doreen Grandpache is a visionary in the field of autism, and now you get to ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have with us Dr. Doreen Grampache. Good Welcome morning. back. So thrilled to have you here thank today. You, thank you. And we're going to be asking questions of Dr. Grampache. But before we start, we want to remind all of you at home that this, th this entire forum here is to help support you and give you information, but there can never be child specific advice. Right. There's a really good reason for that. It would be a disservice to the child, right? Right. We just want to make sure that, um, you know, we don't know the kids, of course we're getting very little information and we don't want to uh, give you the wrong advice because we don't know enough about your child. Yeah, absolutely. And in this format, there wouldn't, there's no possibility of giving us enough information to give child-specific advice for anyone. So I uh, want to remind you of that as we start. So we've had many emails that have come in via email, and we've got, we've got some stuff on the live feature. But I want to start with one that came in earlier in the week that I promised that we would address. My daughter is 10 and has had anxiety since she was little. <coughs> She's on medication, but what else can I do? Do. I try to reassure her, but I encourage her to tell me how she feels. She has a hard time with that. She's so smart. And this anxiety, I believe, is masking her true potential help. Now, I did write this person back and I asked a host of questions. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if wonderful. they're the questions that, awesome. that you would have asked. That's great. Um, but I, I asked things like, how, did the symptoms start suddenly? Uh, has this been going on for a while? Is there anything in particular? So she did give us a little bit more information. Uh, she said she's never 
never had a strep in, uh, infection, to her knowledge. Uh, she's been uh, trying to reassure her or divert attention and praise her for a good job well done. Her anxiety was worse when she was four or five. Medication has helped, but she's now prepubescent and it's starting again. She has that initial anxiety, but once she knows what's happening, she's fine. Uh, she does not take anything but a multivitamin along with her other meds for ADD and recently was put on Risperidol. Uh, and, and she said, thank oh. you so much that you're wonderful. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, so I would have a bunch of other questions. Okay, let's ask away, because she I knows just, we're going to be answering it today. Okay. Well, first of all, there's a lot you can do for anxiety. Anxiety has come up on our show a few times. Yes. It, and, like, um, and I have given a few lectures on anxiety. I think maybe one time we should do a lecture just on anxiety. Because Absolutely. It's a, it shows, it manifests in a lot of different ways. Now, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm really lost in terms of um, trying to, when parents write in, I try to understand who their child is. Yes. And uh, I'm pretty lost on this particular one because usually we recognize anxiety, or parents tend to recognize that some things are anxiety when the child is pretty high functioning. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I think all children, including the children who are very affected by autism, still have anxiety, and that shows up in self stimulatory types of behaviors or obsessive compulsive behaviors. But it, on the, I, I, something gave me the impression that this child is very high functioning, but then at the same time I suddenly heard that the, the child's on Risperdal as well, so I'm not sure now. Uh, the main question I would have is what, it, what symptoms do you see that you're considering to be anxiety and when do they occur? Right, so I would need to know when these behaviors are occurring. So on the one end of uh, the spectrum, I guess, anxiety is like the ritualistic type of stuff that we, that our kids do. This what's also called self stimulatory behavior, or stere stereotypy, because a lot of that is usually just very similar to obsessive compulsive behavior. Mm -hmm. So, an obsessive compulsive behavior is is a form of anxiety. OCD, mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive disorder, is one of the six anxiety disorders. So we do obs we obsess about things in our heads, and then we do compulsions, and those compulsions are pretty similar to self stimulatory behavior. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the other hand, high-level kids uh, exhibit anxiety with th just things like um, you know, whole, having various things that they always want to have with them. I mean, if you think about it, anxiety manifests pretty similarly in us. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say with yourself, I would tell this parent, look at yourself and, and what situations cause you anxiety. So some situations for most people would be, let's say, public speaking that causes anxiety or a new situation that causes anxiety or going to a foreign country. I use that example because uh, I think our kids feel like they're in a foreign country all the time because they don't really understand the language, they don't understand a lot of what's going on around them. Um, often if you're not sleeping, you will have more anxiety. The number one thing I would tell this parent is ADHD medications tend to make you feel anxious. Mm. So that's really important to know. ADHD medications are speed, they're amphetamines. Mm -hmm. And amphetamines will give you heart palpitations or they will just increase um, your, your pulse, your heart rate and so on. And that is a very similar to, uh, feeling to anxiety mm -hmm. and it actually might make you feel anxious. Okay. Uh, pain will make you anxious. So let's say if you go to um, have some sort of food and it disturbs your stomach and then you have you know, gastrointestinal problems, you're going to feel anxious. Um, so I don't know if your child is experiencing any kind of GI problems, has anxiety perhaps. A lot of our kids have diarrhea f 10 times a day, obviously they're going to be experiencing anxiety yeah. when you have that much activity in your stomach and your gut. Um, she does report here that mm -hmm. it centers around um, going places, that it's when right. she has to go someplace. And she says that it's initial anxiety and that once she knows what's happening, she gets better. then she gets better. So let's say that it is similar to what an agoraphobic would mm -hmm. experience, so going out of the comfort zone, mm -hmm. essentially. So and 
if you really want to re, um, rename anxiety and simplify it, it's fear, right? I mean, anxiety is a form of phobia, so sort of similar to phobias. And the treatment for anxiety is basically good that she's on medication. I'm assuming she's on an SSRI, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. The, I, the best uh, treatment is a combination of medication, such as SSRI and um, cognitive behavioral therapy. The therapy to do with it is um, desensitization, which we've done before, we've talked about before here. So you would now list um, the, you know, 20 things, let's say, from the lowest anxiety provoking to the highest anxiety provoking. So the lowest might be hearing about going out or seeing a picture of a place that makes her anxious, and the highest would be actually going out and going to that place. And you list the, like, 10 steps or 20 steps in between the lowest and highest, and then you pair those, so you, and then you teach the child um, some sort of contrary activity or relaxing activity. We do you know, really like meditation activities, breathing, relaxation with deep breathing, you can't really, it slows you down, so that helps. And then once the individual, it could be anything though, it could be like thinking of a funny scene, mm -hmm. it could be um, listening to music, it could be, uh, I don't know, using a massage toy that calms you down, it could be holding some object that calms you down, but basically you have to, so phase one is you make the hierarchy, phase two is you have to make sure that your, your child can engage in some sort of calming activity, soothing activity. Um, and then you pair the two. And so then you basically start with the lowest on the hierarchy, which is like, let's say, talking about going out. And you have the child uh, calm, do that calming activity. So let's say listening to music. Mm -hmm. And then they can handle that without anxiety. And then you do it with step two and step three and step four until you get to the top, which is the hardest one. Um, so it's a, basically a classical conditioning model of pairing um, something that's calming with, with the anxiety-provoking stimulus, but in a graduated format. Um, and that works really, really well. Um, can I ask you, mm -hmm. can an ABA sure. therapist do cognitive behavior uh, techniques with this is this is all a very pure behavioral technique okay. this is so any BACB, bcba or any behaviorist should know how to do systematic okay. desensitization it's a very well known technique um, i'm sure if you google it it'll go into detail the, the stuff that i just said so a behaviorist can help you with that. Okay. Depending on the level of your child, if the child is able to comprehend more language, then you would want to sit down and uh, reason out what's going on and, and identify what's leading to the anxiety, like why are you afraid of mm -hmm. being in public places or going out. Um, and that's really it. But the key to it is that you don't allow the child to avoid the anxiety-provoking stimulus because if you do, it actually gets worse. Yeah. Like in our minds, we tend to obsess about things and make them much more. Uh, you know, I went through this with one of my kids when they were younger and who had a lot of anxiety uh, over different things. I mean, actually, kids always have anxiety. Do, do we know the age of this child? She said 10. 10, yeah. So you tend to have a lot of different anxiety. We all do, you know, Sharon, and we, um, the lecture that I do on anxiety talks about how we all actually have coping mechanisms. Yeah. Some of them are good and some of them are not good. So for instance, you know, uh, people will, the ones that are good might do things like meditation yeah. or, uh, you know, activities, running, et cetera. The ones that are not good mm -hmm. are things like maybe we overeat, yes. uh, we go shopping. I'm familiar with that one. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff <laughs> yeah. like that we, you know, that people do. Yeah. And you always have to remember anxiety and depression are pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. One is, um, you know, outward and one is inward. And anxiety, if it's at a high level for a long time, will lead to what's called hopelessness or depression. Yeah. So you kind of have to make sure that you do these techniques and just get over it. And and I, she had also written in that, uh, I don't know where they are, but that cognitive behavioral therapy is mm -hmm. difficult. There isn't anybody there, but she does get ABA at school. Oh, that's terrific. So, yeah, so some <clears throat> behaviorists would easily be able to 
tell you how to do systematic desensitization. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. And so, and if you have more questions about that, you can write in and give us more information with some of the different things that Dr. Grampuche asked. Uh, okay, we had another family that wrote in extensively about who would they need to take a 15-year-old to to get a diagnosis. They've already spent a great deal of money. Um, they are in an area where there there are a lot of different services, but they're trying to figure out who the definitive person is to go and get a 15-year-old diagnosed. Are they? Where are they? They're in the Chicago area. Uh, oh gosh. I you know you what. If you were here, I'd tell you to come see me. Mm -hmm. You you need to find someone who has, uh, you know. So you're looking at either a psychiatrist, psychologist, yeah. neurologist, but with uh, autism background and history. And this is a tough time because you know this year in May the diagnostic criteria changed completely. Yeah. So you really have to have find someone who is in this field in the world of autism. Otherwise. They won't even know the symptoms, and they and they report that they feel like it's are they it's been overshadowed by the fact that there's a seizure disorder, mm -hmm. and that that's why they're not they haven't been able in the past to get the autism diagnosis. So does that further complicate it? Yeah, it does because <laughs> a lot of when you see if you see a neurologist, for instance, they will tell you that seizures or frequent seizures may lead to some of these sort of delays that we see or, or problem areas that we see within autism. But again, if you see someone who's current and whose job it is to know the diagnostic criteria now, mm -hmm. um, it's a really great time for you to get diagnosed because on the DSM-5, the new diagnostic criteria, you actually have a modifier that says with seizures. So you can have the diagnosis of ASD with seizures, um, and that would be important to do. I, um, you know, the I guess the number one name that I that comes to mind, and, and you know, Margaret Bowman. Mm -hmm. Margaret Bowman is in uh, the Boston area. She does also come to uh, the Los Angeles area mm -hmm. every few months. Mm -hmm. But that's who I would get in touch with. I guess if you need to have a definitive answer, you either have, go to Boston and see Margaret, or come here and see me. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we'll we'll leave that one and see if if you have more information about that that you'd like, you can write to us. And I would and, and I would look at the uh, the universities there. I mean, um, Northwestern is there, and you yeah. should look at the university and see if they have an autism program because I'm sure there's a lot of people who this is all they do. Yeah, there's a great deal of frustration, and, and uh, you know, she, the, the person wrote in several times, I'm just so confused. I feel like we've tried so many things, and they've spent a great deal of money, and, really? and still haven't been able to get it done. Well, so, what, but I guess what I would ask is, what are they looking for? Like, what will it do for you to know the label? Yeah. That's often what I ask people, because it's, so what, you know, like, let's say right. you get the label or you don't get the label. The main thing I think that you're looking for is what's the treatment, mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily have to do with the label. It has to do with the individual symptoms. Okay. So regardless of what the title, the label is, uh, you know, perhaps it would help you if you filled out skills. Go online, go. get on our um, assessment, Skills Index, and on our website, which is uh, skillsforautism.com, mm -hmm. and answer all those questions for your child, and it'll help you identify all the problem areas, I guess, mm -hmm. or deficits, and then treat those, teach those, you yeah. know, I d figure out ways to help your child just learn the things they need to learn regardless of what, what we right. call it. So get into the solution instead of a focusing of times, on getting the diagnosis. And that's the thing, a lot of times we think that we need to know the diagnosis in order to go forward, right? right. And the truth is, with a diagnosis that changes as often as autism has, mm -hmm. it's just it's a series of symptoms. You know, it's like yes, there's social delay of some type, which is usually connected to language delay, and then there's some aberrant behaviors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that subjective, you know, and you put it all together, it, hey, if you have enough of the symptoms, it's called autism. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I always tell people this, you know, I always say, like, it doesn't mean all that much. You could also just say, oh, my child has some language deficits, some social right. deficits, and some behaviors, and treat the individual issues, Yeah. right? If there's language delays, your child needs to learn language, right. and, and if they can't learn language, they need to have a communication device. and.
once you do all that, most of the behaviors tend to go away and then social behavior develops and so on. Okay, great advice. So we're gonna take a break and we're gonna come back. In fact, we have a question about skills that came in this morning on the live feature. So right. we'll be back after these messages. Stick with us. months it can be really nice to sit down and enjoy a nice warm apple crisp and thanks to breads from Anna we can make one for you gluten and yeast free so let's go over what we're gonna need to make the filling you're going to need one and a half teaspoons of ground cinnamon a half a teaspoon of nutmeg one tablespoon of fresh lemon juice seven cups of granny smith apples and three tablespoons of breads from Anna pie crust for your topping you're going to need one cup of rolled oats a third cup of brown sugar three quarters of a cup of breads from Anna pie crust mix three quarters of a cup of butter, melted, one teaspoon ground cinnamon, one tablespoon vanilla, and two tablespoons of water. Don't forget to preheat your oven to 350 degrees. So now let's cut some apples. We're gonna peel and slice six apples. So as you're cutting your apples, make sure you add your lemon juice to make sure that they don't brown and oxidize. So once all my apples are cut and sliced, I'm going to go ahead and add the nutmeg, cinnamon, and the pie crust mix. So we're just going to stir these together. So we've got a 13 by 9, and we're just going to spray this with a little bit of grapeseed oil. and then we're gonna pour our apples into the dish. And to make our topping, we're just gonna combine the rest of the ingredients in a small bowl. All right, that looks pretty good. We're just gonna pour this evenly over the top of the apples and we should be good to go. All right, this is ready to bake, 30 to 35 minutes at 350 degrees. It's been 30 minutes, so our crisp should be all done. All right, it's pretty hot, so you would probably want to let it sit for a little while, but we're going to go ahead and serve up a slice here. To learn how you can win free mix from Breads from Anna, visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autism live. See you soon. Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We have with us Dr. Doreen Grampuche, and she is a true visionary in the field of autism. Thank you so much. It is such a delight to have her here and have her uh, accessible to mm. you to answer your questions. So a lot of you have been writing in. We're going to get to as many of these as we can. Uh, this next one for Dr. Doreen. I have recently signed up for skills and really want to get to the treatment part. I've not yet finished all of the assessment questions. My only question is where to begin. Should I begin with goals from speech OT IEP reports? I consider myself educated in ABA and have taken some IBT courses for things I wasn't sure about. I've read a ton of books and have watched almost all the previous autism live episodes. We bless you. Uh, I feel like I'm losing valuable time because I really want to do all the assessment questions first and then treat, but I noticed that, that more questions were asked added as my child age, going from five years and two months to five years and three months, which is awesome. Where do you think I should begin? It's the $64,000 question. Yeah, right. And, you know, ahead of time, I always apologize to parents because on the one hand, some parents appreciate the fact that we're so obsessive ourselves that we give you 10,000 questions. But yeah. on the other hand, I know it's annoying, believe me. <laughs> I do. I, I mean, I've tried, and this is intelligence software. Like we went back and shortened this thing yes. a million times. It was uh, it was at a point where it would take something like 21 hours or something to fill yeah. it out. It's crazy. So I, you don't have to fill the whole thing out. You can start right now, uh, because generally you answer questions in order of age. So you, the questions that will, you'll get, well, you're going actually across the thing, but. 
um, there are certain questions that, that are presented to you across each domain, and I don't know how, how you've completed. Maybe you've completed a couple of domains and you still have a few other domains left. I don't know. But uh, if you go through a whole domain, any whole domain, let's say language, um, you'll be getting a lot of questions, but the system will order them in terms of age. And so you will have already the youngest ones available. You know, it, the system tells you to do the ones that are youngest mm -hmm. first. So what I would suggest you do is, if you are short on time, this is what I would do. I would do the language. How old is the child? They don't say. Oh, no, 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 they do. They do five. Five, five right. Old. So I would do language and play and social probably first. Mm -hmm. And um, those are very long. Um, and then I would pick from those pro programs. So once you finish the assessment, obviously it produces for you. You go to the section that says, you know, pick programs or whatever, and that, then you have a whole ton of lessons. And depending on how many hours, this is some of the changes that I'm making to skills right now, is let's say if you have, if you're actually doing 40 hours a week, then feel free to pick a total of about 20 programs from all of the sort of the supermarket available for you, for you and pick the first few. Right, that the system tells you. But if you don't, if you have 20 hours, then maybe you want to pick, let's say, 10 to 15 programs and see. You, you essentially want to make sure that your child's schedule is pretty packed with these lessons, and that you're doing a little bit of repetition, but not a lot. So in the same session, in the same, let's say you have a two-hour session, you want to be able to give the child all different types of activities. Um, you don't want to do repeated the same activity multiple times because it will repeat over the course of the week. So um, and that's it. So you can start right now with the lessons, and you know, by if you need if you need some assistance, just call us. Call call here and ask for. Um, you can call and talk to skills the skills department, or you can just go on our eight hundred number. And we will literally give you one or two hours of a supervisor, whatever you need, on the phone to kind of guide you through the system and tell you how to use things. Mm -hmm. You can also um, uh, email uh, Adele Najowski, who was one of the people who uh, helped create skills. Um, Dr. Najowski's email is, here we go, A dot N A, I think N A J. D O W S K I, um, and you will dot, um, at, dot at center for autism dot com. So, uh, and she's here every Friday. Oh, and, great. And she answers a, a, a live skills question every Friday when she's here. Um, so, you can also ask her questions then when she's yeah, here on yeah. Fridays in the first hour. Right. She's always here. And she will uh, be able to help you, guide you as well, mm -hmm. um, or just call the skills uh, hotline, or you can call card. And somebody, we can easily give you a couple of hours of a supervisor who will guide you through the system. But you don't have to wait. You can start right now. Uh, you know, and depending on the level of your child, you're going to be starting with earlier skills. And I would focus right now on those three. I find the most important curricula, I think, and having written pretty much all of it or most of it, is that I think language and social are the two key curriculum areas for ch younger children. Mm -hmm. As you get older, we're looking at the cognition and EF curriculum. I, and I would just like to throw in two cents as a parent that I know when I first started skills and I would look at the lesson and I would go, I don't know which one. It's overwhelming. I, I, don't, I don't know which one. And you know, there are five different criteria that help you to pick and that's all very well and good. But I was afraid to jump in because I thought, what if I jump in at the wrong point? But the thing that I discovered was if you jump in at the wrong point, it becomes infinitely clear to you within seven seconds. Yeah. You see, oh my goodness, they already know this, I can move on to the next lesson. Or you see, okay, I don't have enough things, I gotta go back and I can't skip that lesson that I thought I could skip. Right, right. And, it, and it, if you just jump in, it becomes clear. Right, and if you answered questions, if you did, weren't sure about questions, if, what I always say is if you're not sure whether your child can do something, just be safe and say no. Yeah. And then that way you'll it'll be included in your in your lesson plan. So, and I don't think I mean I you know your child's five and I don't know where you live where your concern is the IEP. The reason we wrote the IEP goals is just so that you can actually 
produce an IEP report and, and give it to your school and have people at school work on the same goals that you're working on but don't let that be your guide your guide is your treatment uh, plan like where all the lessons are that's your guide but the IEP goal thing is it's so good. luscious yeah and it's so, so we're luscious. working on a report right now where it'll just print reports for you as well but I'm doing so much stuff right now on skills it's crazy we're changing a lot of stuff on version two three four we're working on like it's gonna have a new um, f skin altogether, and it's gonna have it's gonna help pick lessons for you, so you don't even have to think. There you go. Yeah, it'll be very nice. I'm very excited. But the IEP feature has helped me so much. Great. It has changed the IEP process for me. Great. Great. Uh, and so I don't have to stress anymore, and that is amazing. That's wonderful. Uh, okay, so next question here: How can I teach my son to stop his video games appropriately? I pre-teach before he plays. We've practiced putting the controls down when the timer beeps he gets a countdown slash warning starting at 10 minutes left and he earns a token for stopping within 30 seconds of the timer going off <laughs> which will add more time to the video games after he earns five love this parent I'm stealing that uh, he usually asks for more time politely or to finish the level he is on but this can take several more minutes I thank him for asking nicely and sometimes honor his request but it's usually a battle every night he would rather argue with me and keep playing than earn a token please help the simplest thing is you, I think you can buy these on Amazon, they might even have them at uh, Best Buy as well. It's sort of a little switch that just shuts the computer off at a certain time. Yeah. I mean, I think you're doing a lot of really good stuff, mm -hmm. but I think he's learned that negotiating with you will give him some additional work, time. And also, maybe you're right, maybe he's actually enjoying the battle. Uh, the easiest thing is to switch it off. No conversation at all. When the buzzer goes, you just switch it off. That's it. And if you don't want to be the bad guy to do that, then there are these uh, switches that shut the electricity off to a, to a device. That's brilliant. We, we have on the computer, mm -hmm. uh, on the parent controls, where it shuts off at a certain there time. There you go, and I'm pretty but sure. But I don't have it on the, on like the, the, iPad or uh, the, um, the Xbox. Xbox. And but you're right. I know that there are switches that will turn yeah. things off for like your your uh, yeah. sprinklers and things. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly. And I would be great. Like, that's sort of like a timer so on. But I, I we even have and you could actually put a timer on pretty much anything, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but we <clears throat> we do have kids who are um, very advanced, you know, and they sometimes want and the parents are like sometimes have to sleep earlier and can't watch over the child at mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night or something and so in those cases this helps as well it's like where they the, the whole household shuts down at 10 you know so I love it it's it's entirely how you want it. it's up to you how you want to deal with it but you just the easy answer is just shut the thing off and no no conversation at all he will get upset initially but he'll get over it yeah Okay, great, great advice. We're going to take another break and come back with more of your questions for Dr. Doreen Grambache after these messages. Hi guys, welcome back to Smarty. For this month, I figured we we're going to do a super special portrait that is in the theme of October, which means spooky eyes that follow you as you walk around. In this activity, you and your child are going to work on emotions and social dramatic play. So let's get started. The materials you'll be needing are a camera, a ping pong ball, exacto blade, tape, and a marker. And if your kids are up to it, props and costumes. Now let's take some photos. It's a great time to work in emotions and socio-dramatic play. Let's get our props. See all the colors in the sky tonight. Time to let the sunshine hide. Once you've finished your photo shoot with your child, select one of the photos and print it out on a large piece of paper. Now that you've selected your photo, you're going to take an X-Acto blade and just cut out the eyes from it. This part of the activity is definitely only for the adults. Now that you've finished cutting out the eyes, what we're going to do next is take a ping pong ball and cut it in half. You'll see why in just a moment. 
So with the ping pong balls, we're gonna create the illusion of the following eyes. So what you're gonna do is take a marker and you're gonna make a dot in the very, very center. You're gonna wanna make it like the same size of what the iris was in the photo. Now that the ping pong balls are done, I'm just gonna tape them to the back of the photograph. So does it look like she's following you? Well, I hope you enjoyed this activity for Smarty. Until next time, craft on, guys. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. We are here with Dr. Doreen Grampache, who is an amazing, amazing brain to pick in the field mm -hmm. of autism. She has had extensive experience, multiple decades, uh, working with children on the autism spectrum. Uh, there is no one better that we could have in the chair that you could ask questions of from a wide variety of subjects having to do with autism. And you guys have been writing in. Our next question from a viewer, I have a very physically aggressive six-year-old boy he's getting ABA in the home I have three younger children that he has hurt mm -hmm. how do I protect them when he is having an episode and I am home alone with all four I used to have a safe word that I used they would run into the bathroom oh. until he calmed down do you have any other suggestions for dealing with aggression uh, aggressive behavior and thank you oh my gosh I that know. is a tough 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 situation I don't think you should be using a safe word with the others I don't think the others should be um, I mean afraid of him like should be taught that when you hear this word run away and be afraid I think that this is one of those situations where you honestly need to have an adult there all the time you should never be left alone with four of them one of them being aggressive Never. And I don't know if you can make that happen, but you have to put everything you have into that because it will be important for the other children's lives going forward. You need to have not just respite care, you need to have a behaviorist with you uh, until this aggression comes under control. The aggression it has to do with frustration. Aggression is always about frustration, and it's not. It's basically not understanding that you know the rules of society. Not understanding that we can't have everything we want right away. And aggression is just a form of communication that mm -hmm. says, "I want to have this, or I want to avoid this now, immediately." And that's about it. And if there's other kids around. I'm going to hit them, hurt them, whatever it is, because I might want their toys or they might be too loud or, or bothering me or whatever it is. But, um, you know, a, a good behaviorist for six months could help you really get that under control. And I would really, really recommend that you do that. I, does the parents say where they are? We no. don't know what sources it, of funding it, you have. But. but they wrote in this morning, so if you're still watching, please write in and tell us what state you're in so we can help. I mean, I just got overwhelmed thinking about oh this gosh. story and hearing what, because I'm sure that you're watching and you're thinking, you know, that would be great. But Except I can't get help. I right. know, and like the majority of our families say, it's so hard, I can't get help anywhere. But I think sometimes it takes somebody like you saying, this has to be the thing that happens for us to think outside the box, box and think, how could I do this? Is there yeah. a family member that, you know, could, could help me out? Can I go back to my ABA provider? Can I say, look, this is serious for my entire family. Is there a way we can make this work? Right. Can you afford to hire someone, anyone out of high school, you know, just as with a high school education? Can you afford to hire them at minimum wage and put them through IBT training yeah. so that they know exactly how to, we have training online, Institute for Behavioral Training, um, which will help them deal with challenging behaviors. You should not be alone with four children, one of whom is aggressive. It just, it's a failure, it's a setup for failure. You just, and if you're in California, I promise you you would get funding in a lot of other states you would get funding this is what's this is a pretty dangerous type of situation and and 
you know, there are sources of funding for this type of thing. So I really, really urge you to try to do something. Get, like as Shannon said, maybe a family member and then put them through training. Um, you know, that's really what you have to do. And and so feel free to write us back and let us know where you are and if there's the way that we can help you to figure out where your funding source may be, be available where you are. I'm sure you're overwhelmed, um, but you know, I want I want you to hear what Dr. Grand Pichet said that it would change if you were able to put this thing in place, and I'm sure that feels huge. Right. But imagine six months from now not having to live with this pit of fear in your stomach, versus this continuing until something really tragic happens. Yeah, and just think of I mean, I'm sure I don't have to tell you. Like I know that this this parent is is going through a lot. Yeah. Going yeah, through a lot. I'm, I'm, and I I'm just I, for you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm just concerned for the kids, for the other yeah. kids, because I would not want them to be taught to run away. Just yeah. I, I, that's horrible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hard advice to hear, but essential. I'm so glad that you spoke it. Yeah. Because uh, that is that is hard to hear. Okay. Moving on to some uh, very topical things. We have a couple of questions about dealing with Halloween. Oh, okay. Uh, because it's it's looming large. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we have one person who wants to know how do you work on getting a child to trick or treat? Uh, another who says my child is newly afraid of any everything. Any suggestions for Halloween? Yeah. So I mean, the the question about how to trick or treat is a little hard because I don't know anything about the child and the level of functioning of your child will help determine how you handle that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, with our, just assume that your child, if your child's functioning like a little, you know, two year old, um, or your child's functioning like a five year old, you you do what we do with our typically developing kids when they first go trick or treating. They have no clue what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what's going on and you know I used to sing going down the street so my kids wouldn't get scared uh -huh. so I can't really respond to that question very well because I'm not sure yeah. um, what the issues are and I'm not sure what level of functioning a child is but um, for the other child I think the issue was that they're afraid of things newly afraid of everything yeah and and that is goes back to what we talked about which is for fears uh, we do systematic desensitization so it's great that you have what is it a week left or yes you got a, a whole week a whole week and a, uh, and during this week what I would do is I would immediately produce that hierarchy that I talked about mm -hmm. from the most fear-provoking to the least uh, you know focused on a subject that has to do with Halloween obviously um, and then I would start to maybe do some sort of fun activity like maybe playing music and dancing uh, or singing or whatever and pair the two so that your child realizes that this is just make-believe and it's pretend and um, you know it, it, it's tough these days our kids are exposed to a lot more than we were at their age I mean I know I try to keep my kids away from w even watching things that are kind of but you can't anymore I mean there's you know series out there on TV that are all with zombies and bodies oh. being cut up and stuff. My it's kids in commercials. Have, and my kids have seen things that I ha that yeah. still freak me out <laughs> to this point. You know, so I don't know. I would say it's hard to prevent that sort of thing. So it's more that you have to kind of. Uh, maybe have your child draw stuff or draw things and say see it's not for real it's a drawing but really the the answer is systematic desensitization you have to do that sort of set of treatments and help your child uh, overcome fear the fear is a big factor it plays a big role in a lot of things we do and and halloween has gotten really really dark yeah really dark yeah i know i mean it's like even i know the other day I, you know my you know my kids so the other day i was out with my 18 year old daughter and we were buying some decorations for the house and she's like such an angel and she was like oh let's get the you know cute pumpkin and the this and that and i was like yeah i think your brother actually wants some gore <laughs> You know, and it's it's funny though that it has gone in that direction. Yeah, yeah. it's it's really hard to find the cute decorations anymore. You yeah. can find a pumpkin, and that's about it. Yep, yep. Things uh, have changed. Very scary. Uh, okay. Uh, next question, Dr. Grampuche. Thank you for all you do. I'm trying to work with my child myself, doing skills and IBT, but sometimes I feel like it takes longer uh, to learn because it's me and not a stranger. Do you think parents can work oh, yeah. effectively with their kids? 
Yeah, you are absolutely right. It will take longer with you as a parent. It took longer with me as a parent, too, with my own kids. It just is that the it's, you have already been conditioned to be mom or dad, and you are the uh, love stimulus, the care stimulus, the, the, the comfort stimulus. And so it makes no sense to the child that you now would be the one to also withdraw, let's say, a reward or something like that. So it takes longer. And our kids kind of know us and they sort of know how to press our buttons and manipulate us really well. And, it, you know, the minute we feel guilt or fear or something, we back off. So like the other parent who had written in, it just becomes a manipulation and, and an ongoing kind of dialogue, and that's always bad. It's a lot easier when it's a stranger coming in, yeah. definitely. Because your child doesn't know, have a relationship with that person yet, yeah. so and they're just developing, and if you set the relationship from the start in, in the correct way, then things go easier. Having said that, Ultimately, you need to establish this relationship anyway because you're not, it's, you know, ABA is not just about a specific set number of hours of the day. You really kind of have to live it. And it's just really good parenting to be able to know how to give rewards, how, when to remove rewards, when attention can be rewarding, when, you know, all of that sort of stuff just come, kind of becomes part of you. So my recommendation is for the core sit down, do therapy time, it's always better to have someone who's, let's say, you know, a therapist or a third party and then, but still do really become fluent and familiar with all the techniques yourself as well. And I will say that now with IBT, you can train someone very easily and cost effectively to be able to do therapy with your child in addition right. to you. And I don't know whether I heard about this or I dreamt about it or whatever, but I swear that I heard about two moms who had gotten trained, were working with their own children and saw that it, that they wished it would be just a little bit faster with a stranger. And so they would do therapy they with each slip, other's slip. children. Yep, yep, I yep. wish I could find, if that's true, who they are to have them on the show, because it's a great idea. It is a great idea, and that's right. If, if they're listening, they should call in. Yes, absolutely. But there, I've heard of parents doing that before, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, we've had kids recover, Shannon, who, uh, you know, mom is living in a small, small, small town somewhere, mm -hmm. and they will hire, they will literally, not even hire, the entire village volunteers yes. and gets trained and they do shifts with the child. Yes. So, you know, every, anyone with IBT stuff, anyone can be doing this work. Um, it's always good to have someone experienced overseeing the yeah. whole thing. But uh, yeah, it's, it's usually very much easier when it's someone else than it is you. But there's such great value to to working through it yourself oh, yes. as well like you really you know when someone else comes into the picture they will they will get stimulus control so they'll be able to get your child to be compliant let's say but you won't yeah you know until you work through it your child will differentiate and they will know uh, this guy means business, but I can mess around with mom a little bit. Right. So there's a huge value in you actually working through and continuing to be consistent and give the same messages to your yeah. child. I totally agree. I totally agree. Uh, do, do you need a break or should we oh, forge I'm, on? I'm fine. Okay. Uh, from a teacher, we have, how can I get a student in my class to stop picking his nose third grade and thank you? Oh, um, <laughs> Succinct. Let's see. You can do a number of things. I mean, for a teacher, it's very hard because you have to watch over multiple other kids, of course. So you could do a response cost system. So every time that the child, um, their finger actually touches their nose, mm -hmm. um, they lose a token. And it's the reward system would be on a duration. So let's say, um, what I would do is I would probably target specific times of the day and I would say these are the times that he tends to do this most. So 
I don't know, let's say through story time. I don't know the age of the child or the activities. Third grade. Third grade. grade. So let's say, uh, you know, during this particular lesson, let's say during math or during uh, literature or spelling or whatever it is, um, the child tends to do it more. So I would target one time frame at a time. And I would say during this time frame, um, we're going to put a timer and you put the timer and you start with or you could do something quiet so it doesn't bring a lot of attention like perhaps say an egg timer three minutes that's actually a pretty good time frame three minutes and if the child doesn't touch their nose at all in three minutes then you reward them and then it becomes six minutes or five minutes six minutes ten minutes whatever and you increase the time frame and if they do you will give so if they are if they don't then you just go over to the child and give them a smiley face. And if they then accumulate, let's say, 10 smiley faces, a token economy, um, then they will get be able to trade that in for some free time or some activity or something like that. And if they do, they'll get a sad face. And uh, sad faces will lose something, some activity or, you know, that's... And token systems are really effective if the child is high functioning enough to get it Mm -hmm. Um, but they're hard to put in place you really need to do a good it's very important that the tokens have a have an equal value the value is weighed according to the reward they get at the end it's kind of like money Um, money is a token money on its own has no value at all but money has value because it buys you things right but if you needed to accumulate ten thousand dollars in order to buy a soda Mm -hmm. then you wouldn't really work hard because it's not worth it it's on it feels unattainable it's not unattainable unattainable. it feels unattainable exactly so those are the key things with a token economy are that you it needs to be fair right and so I, I really recommend that you have someone help you set that up um, I don't know if we even have any training on how to set up token economies I bet IBT does because it's a very key thing important thing to do mm-hmm. so um, that would be one thing you could do another thing you could do is for instance um, you know perhaps put some form of cream or something on the child's uh, finger. I, I actually try to find out why the child is doing this. Mm-hmm. Like, it could have formed into a habit, but it could also be because the child has allergies. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, you need to, you know, it's something that requires a little attention, and it's hard for the teacher to do that. But I don't recommend. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm always very cautious with kids. I don't want them getting embarrassed in front of other kids. So. The, really, a token system is probably your best bet because it's not as attention, uh, you know, grabbing as any other kind of. You don't want to block it because it becomes very obvious. The other kids would make fun of the child and so on. But try to find out because on, if there's something that's provoking the child, like they have an allergic reaction or they're itchy, their nose is itchy. Right. Uh, you know that you'll, your token system won't work because they always have a continuous need to like touch their nose. Okay, going back to why are they doing it to begin with? Right. Okay, great. Uh, I'm interested in this one because we were working on this this morning. How can I work on my child's memory for things like state capitals and multiplication tables? It's so boring. I just can't. Uh, I think it's get him to care. <laughs> we were working on state capitals this morning. Uh, Because there was a quiz on the southern states this morning and a quiz on the digestive system. Uh, So we're trying to come up with all these devices for him to be able to remember it. But it is, when it's dry like that, when it's just pure memorization, to make it rewarding enough is like a full-time job. It is. It is. And, you know, memorization is just repetition and you can't do anything about it. I remember doing that with my kids and it was actually one of the fun things we did because... Oh, share. (laughs) We used to, um, well, you know this, this is Sonny, right? My Mm -hmm. son is a comedian, so he would forever, and I wish he would still do that, but forever he used to, dinner time was his time to perform. Like he would come up with some game at dinner every night for the entire family. And this was one of the games because he was memorizing this and he, we turned it into a game because 
quite honestly, the rest of us did not know all the capitals, and he did. <laughs> and so it, it was a matter of he was motivated to learn them because he would win this game. Okay. And the game was essentially, you know, you'd pull out of a, um, so you'd have the name of a state on one side of the paper, and then on the back side, inside, you'd have the capital. Okay. And it was all in a hat, and each person would draw one out, and they'd look at the name of the state, and they'd have to say what the capital was, and of course, whoever could would get a point. Okay. And so Sonny was the one that always could because and because he studied. Uh -huh. But I mean, it's just it's just rote memory. You have to do that. It's just repetition. But it really it was, it was so much fun that you know a lot of us learned because of that. So make it fun. And writing things tends to help our memory. Okay. So you read it. You you know you'll write California, Sacramento. You you write it out. Writing in, enhances memory. There's memory techniques, obviously, like studying techniques. So studying techniques are you will um, mass study something, let's say five days earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So you just study it, study it, study it. Mm -hmm. Then four days later, like four days to the test, um, you'll study a little bit mm -hmm. and then three days a little bit less and two days a little bit less so there's these techniques where mm -hmm. you decrease the amount of time you're studying but you refresh mm -hmm. as you get closer and you mix it with other activities and that repetition over the course of days is what really works great I think yeah. everybody else, uh, most people do it the reverse of that. That they look at it a little five days before and then they look at they it a cram, lot the night before, right, yes. Right, But if you spend like, let's say three days before, or four days before and you just reintroduce it, that's when you kind of learn is, is um, okay. over time frames, yeah. Okay, great, so getting a, an early jump on it, I love that. I'm gonna play that game tonight at the dinner table. Have fun. <laughs> Math well. now, on the other hand, this is one of the things in English we don't have um, math timetable. In other languages, they have songs, kind of like the mm -hmm. ABC. A lot of other languages have songs for the. Really? And that, it's interesting because I learned, you know, I'm Iranian, so I learned math, the timetables in, in Farsi. Wow. And um, to this day, when I do, and I, Lobos used to do this too, Ivar used to do it in Norwegian. It's interesting that math is one of those things that I think because we learn it early in life, mm -hmm. when you do it later in life, you tend to go back to your own language when you calculate. Like, mm -hmm. To this day, when I calculate things, I'm calculating them in Farsi. Really? Yeah, and Ivar used to tell me that he know he noticed that he calculates in Norwegian. It's funny. And so, did you teach those songs to your kids, or did you? No, but well, my kids don't speak the at all. Farsi that well. No, and it's just it wasn't. It's it's rhymes like mm -hmm. you know, uh, two times two is four in English would be do do to charta. So it's kind of a rhyme, oh, you know. So you remember it. Um, and so that that's you know you have to think of tricks yeah. like you know the nine tables one of my kids taught me that you I know, don't I don't know the trick oh you have to know nines nines okay. are the best okay. right I'll, I'll, so you hold out your hands okay. right and so a nine the nines are the hardest like right. all kids get messed up with nines yeah. right so each of the your fingers is represented as as a as a number right so this okay. is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten okay, okay? so if you want to say nine times one uh -huh. you put your your little finger down <laughs> I okay. can't do it and how many fingers do you have left you've got nine nine okay, okay. that's the end nine times two you put the two finger down right and what do you have you have okay. one and eight eight eighteen eight oh one clever. and eight 18. Oh, if you want to say good. say nine times four, right. you put the four digit down. Right. What do you have left? Thirty six. Oh, I see. I was I was just counting the. But no, it's, it, gives it, you, it gives you the first digit here and. So the, no, you literally okay. So pick a number nine times three. Okay, so, so put the that's the one three down. digits. So twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. Okay. Clever. Nine times whatever. Pick so, another one. So nine times five. I five. would put this one down. I've got 45. 45. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> yeah. Somebody needs to patent that. How nice would it be if we had that for, for each everyone, one of them? Yeah. Oh, that's clever. All right. Life changing. <laughs> right. Right? It's the little things little that are so exciting, yeah, right? Right, right? Oh, I can't wait to show that to Jem. He'll love it. That's, I can't wait to show it to Jim, my husband. <laughs> He'll love it. That's awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. Mm, that kind of made my day. Oh, good. Thank I'm glad. you. That's really. <laughs>
<laughs> Let's really end cool. on that note. Yes. No, we pretty much are out of time anyway, so we want to thank you for being here. My pleasure. Uh, and if people have more questions, they can write in and, and let us know so that we can address them uh, at a future date. Great. Thank you so much for being pleasure, here. Pleasure, always. Very nice And to be here. we're going to take a break and go to the A Word. This is an ongoing documentary that's being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders, following a little boy, Jack Riley, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. Take a look at how incredible Jack Riley is doing now as a result of this early intensive ABA therapy. When we come back, we'll have Nancy Oswald Jackson with us for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We have a very special guest today. Maria Paz is with us. She'll be talking about resources for Spanish speaking families. Stick with us. I know a cute little blue eyed boy, and his name is Jack. Jack Riley. He got a big, warm, blue eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. Yes, I, I sing Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Everybody around is so down with Jack. What do you want to eat? Can I have corn on the cob and some turkey? I want to eat anything else. Yeah, I want dessert now. A few months ago, Jessica and Jack Riley began doing functional pretend play, where they played with toys functionally. For example, placing pretend food on a plate and then pretending to eat it. Recently, they began practicing sociodramatic play, where they each take on a different role. They've been playing restaurant, where they take turns being the waiter, cook, and customer. Hi, welcome to the restaurant. Hi, welcome to my restaurant. Hi. Good job. I would like to eat some oranges and a hot dog, please. Hello. Welcome to my restaurant. What you, would you like to eat today? Um, hot dogs and drinky burgers. You want a hot dog, a burger, anything to drink? Milk. Milk? Now that he understands the different roles, they're going on an outing to a real restaurant to see if he can implement what he's learned through play. Jack Riley. Where are we going? To the restaurant. To the what? Restaurant. Restaurant. You're not saying the word, really. We're going to the restaurant. Thank you. Come on, Suzanne. Okay, I'm coming. Have you gone to a restaurant with Jack Riley recently? Not recently. Uh, it's been quite a while, actually, so we've been sort of excited because we haven't gone since uh, he's been sort of playing restaurant at home. I'm going to Here's breakfast. These are good breakfasts right here. And there's all of us at the top of that. Yeah, those are burgers and pizza and stuff, but we want to have breakfast, I think. And there's mud and nice cream on the pizza. Yeah. Do you like the restaurant so far? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, there's, and there's coffee that you want to drink. Daddy wants to drink. What do you want? What do you want? I think we're not going to have pie. We'll, we'll come back for dinner and have pie, okay? Good morning. How are you? Good. Morning. How are you? Fine. Can, can, can I have a... No. I, want, I want a blueberry waffles, please. <laughs> Good order, Jeff Riley. You ordered it all by yourself. Thanks, I think you appreciate it. And I wanted... So, and I wanted that so cute. Thank you. Yummy, yummy. Mm. Real blueberries. Oh, Look yeah. at this. Special order. It has yogurt. Did you say thank you, Jack? Oh, no, that's even better than yogurt. Say thank you. Thank you. Great appetite. Yeah. Wow. I can eat a little bit. You are a growing boy. Hey, can we sit better? Thank you. Can we sit better, buddy? Hey, mister, I don't see your face. There it is. There you go. Do you want to eat more or do you want to be done? Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I'm Nancy Oswald Jackson. And I'm Shannon Penrod. It's so good to see you. <laughs> good to see you too. It's been very hectic this morning, so I feel like I'm just seeing you for the first time. Yeah, yeah, just walked into the studio. <laughs> so uh, 
Yeah, and we've got a lot of stories in the news this yes. week. Yes, and a very exciting guest yes, is going to uh, be with us today. Maria is going to be with us, who was very instrumental uh, when she worked for Assembly Member Perez in the state, California State Assembly, uh, in getting uh, AB 132 passed into law, which yes. Act Today sponsored, which uh, made it possible, is making it possible to have more Spanish-speaking uh, coordinators at the regional center. Yeah. Um, so that's a big win for us. Absolutely. And for the Hispanic community. So she's going to be talking with us about other legislation, other resources that yes. we have. Absolutely. For, for those Spanish-speaking families. Yes. And, and I know you have been a huge champion of making sure that those families get information mm -hmm. and services yes. and access. We have Act Espanol, which is one of our new programs. And uh, I want to talk to Maria uh, because she is Hispanic and she knows about a lot of the cultural differences that make sometimes diagnosis uh, and other and getting treatment some of the hurdles to that. So I think that's very important to discuss. So that's Absolutely. exciting today. So we'll look forward to yeah. that. But we have some uh, a wide In the array news, of news yes. stories. Um, we have been covering um, for uh, since this story first broke uh, back in January, uh, Ethan Saylor, who has had Down syndrome, who was handcuffed and restrained by police in Maryland um, and died uh, as a result of being um, set on yeah. uh, by the police. And um, they, the family has now filed a uh, wrongful death suit. Um, so that, you know, it, it's sort of, it, there had been calls for it, and um, I don't know whether what it was. There was a petition uh, which received a lot of attention. Finally, uh, I know there were several activists and advocates in the community that felt like this, this story was completely glossed over. They brought a lot of attention to it. It has now, um, you know, come to this, and um, it, 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 they say it was a tragic and unnecessary death that this young man, um, because he refused to leave, there was no one uh, there that had any experience in dealing with a special needs individual. Yeah. And I think we all know um, that many of our kids on the spectrum, many uh, young adults, young people with Down syndrome, autism, uh, if they are nonverbal, they would not be able to explain to police if they were confronted. And so this is a very important case for that, I believe, that if anything, if it brings more um, attention to the kind of special care in confronting someone like this, and instead of treating them like a hardcore criminal, yeah. realizing, and certainly it was evident that he was Down syndrome, right. and it's tragic, so. It is tragic, and I, and I want to say, too, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the amount of publicity that, uh, that people are giving to it now because mm -hmm. of this lawsuit, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's what has to happen. Yes. But if you're watching and you're concerned about these issues with your child, because as you said, it was evident that this young man had Down syndrome, and if it had been autism, that that piece, that physical piece of being able to vis visibly see that there was something else going on, wouldn't even have been there. Yes. If you're concerned about those kinds of things, I, I we've had Emily Island before yes. on the show. Good point. She trains. Uh, police mm -hmm. in and how to respond mm -hmm. and educates them yes and she also has a movie that is out now be safe the movie to train our kids of how to respond yes. when these kinds of things happen yeah. it's an important um i think it's important i have not yet talked to wyatt about these mm -hmm. issues but um, i'm glad you brought that up i'm going to uh, have him take a look at be safe the movie and i'm going to let him know that if ever a police officer confronts him he needs to put his hands up and yeah. say yes officer and be trained in that so we urge all of you to take a look at that be safe yeah. the movie and if you have questions um, i'm sure you could write us here and we could connect you with emily because she does police training uh, it's yeah. she's absolutely amazing yeah. there is one scene in the video where they, they they show and the actors are on the spectrum uh -huh. and it was all done by inclusion films by the way yes. the, all the filming they show a young man being wrongfully stopped but there's yeah. a reason why and they show why he's stopped right and they show him you know behaving properly but the the police pull guns out and mm -hmm. point them at mm -hmm. him and i know as a parent when i saw that i went oh 
<gasps> you know, and I thought, I need to talk to Jem about that because if somebody pulled out a gun, I, he wouldn't just hold his no, hands up. No, neither would so my son. So I, I, I literally think, you know, it's this is an important film to watch for these reasons. So, Very much. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we have, um, you've discussed this case, but I wanted to bring it up with you um, because we we heard the story you when did you cover it last Which week Which one are we or, talking about the, the the driver of the, the minivan bus driver? yes uh, the bus driver who was tied up the autistic student yes. with a belt with a yes. seat belt uh, uh, yeah in Palm Beach I Florida think it, I think it was last Thursday that we Okay did it, we all right well he lost his job yes um, so you know there were definitely consequences on that one uh, I'm sure there was enough outrage over the situation um, you know did he, you see the video I have not seen that video. You don't want to see the video. Okay. It's horrifying. Okay. It's absolutely horrifying. All right. I, you know, I'm so glad that the the young girl who videotaped it, who's on the spectrum, uh, her mom had, had had talked to her about that she, if something was happening that was bad or wrong, she could videotape it mm. with her phone, and she did. And and how what a lesson that is for all of us about teaching our kids how to be safe and how to use a phone if they have it. But it's it's a horrible video. Okay. I mean. You know, the man was dismissed immediately upon seeing it. Right. There was no discussion. Okay, no discussion. Uh, about, well, that's well, good when it's black and white that way, because sometimes these things are endlessly drawn yeah. out. I mean, let's look at the Trayvon Martin. Well, that was not a disabled oh. child, but let's, you know, there's the right. controversy over that. And uh, sometimes there's so many shades of gray in these yeah, cases, well, but here it was a cut and dry case. And the bus driver abuse. said, well, what was I supposed to do? Because he kept trying to open the door. Right. And I thought, well, I don't know. Let's try getting some behavioral training. <laughs> yeah. You know, or let's try, you know, silly. pulling over, calling the parents, calling the school district and say, I, right. I can't handle this child Filing right a report yeah. saying this yeah. child is, is a safety hazard yeah. and I need some help Not treating him like an animal and tying right. him up. Or worse than an animal. No one should treat an animal that way. Okay. Exactly. Um, this one's interesting to me because... <laughs> Yesterday, I had a situation where, um, let me first tell you the story, which is Charles Couch is a caregiver to a disabled boy in California, mm -hmm. is suing the city of Manhattan Beach. He claims he was subjected to false arrest, illegal search and seizure, and a number of civil rights violations after he was arrested in a sting operation in a bathroom where authorities claim many homosexuals participate in anonymous sex. So. He claims his ward went to use the public restroom while he waited outside. He says it wasn't unusual for the boy to take a long time. At some point, an undercover entered into the stall next to the boy who bolted. The boy came out and told Couch that a man was looking at him through a hole. Couch tried to leave with his ward when they were stopped by Clank's closed police officers. Couch claims he feared for the safety of the boy because the officers were dressed like thugs. They were undercover. When he tried to go, he claims they tackled, choked, and handcuffed him. And he was detained for hours, accused of child endangerment and gay cruising. The boy's parents vouched for Couch to the police. Eventually, he was re released. All right. Well, yesterday, um, my my best friend and Wyatt's godmother has been in town for a number of weeks here and was visiting us, Gina. And um, we, uh, Wyatt didn't have any vacation all summer mm -hmm. because he did a Linda Mood Bell uh, comprehension program over the summer and had hours and hours of ABA therapy. So we took him out of school for a day and took him down to Newport Beach. Now, at the age of 12 or almost 12, next month. He is too young for me to go into a bathroom with him. I don't take him into the ladies' room anymore, but I'm a little concerned about public bathrooms. So, particularly because he likes to play in water and has been known to splash in toilets and other things. So, um, I gave him his clothes. I told him, you know, you're going to go in, you're going to change, go in the big stall, dry yourself off and change because, you know, I'm always afraid he might run out naked. I don't know. Right. You know, right. I mean, he's not as aware of those things as he should be. Right. So I sent him into the bathroom and he was in there kind of a long time. I noticed another man going in and I stopped him and said, my son's in there. Will you please let me know if he seems to be having a problem getting dressed because he's on the autism spectrum and, you know, he had sand and salt water all over him. And uh -huh. the man went in and he came out and he said, he's fine. He's almost done. So. I was really in a quandary about what to do in that situation. Should I have taken him into the women's room and just told women if they came in, you know, excuse it. me, get over <laughs> it, whatever. The fact that this caregiver who was outside and waiting for this boy was arrested 
and handcuffed and thrown to the ground it's shocking to me. It is. I, I mean, it, it really brings up a lot of questions in my mind about, uh, you know, I, I, we have no idea what happened, of course. Right. This is the one side of the story. I'd love to hear the police's side of the but story. But if the parents vouch but, for the caregiver, I don't understand why there would have been any reason to detain him and arrest him I, if they knew know, it was a child with autism. I mean, maybe they had doubts that he might have right? kidnapped him. I don't know. Right. You I know, there, maybe there are some shades of gray in this story, but if they tackled, choked, and did all this and you know if the parents vouched for him it seems like certainly immediately it should have been recognized well I have a question back before that I mean the fact that the that the young man came out and said somebody was looking at him through a hole if you're involved in a sting operation you shouldn't be looking at people through a hole in the bathroom yeah, stall right, right I wouldn't think that that would be part of the sting operation that wouldn't seem appropriate to no me. but evidently it was well, that, you know, if it were somebody involved that, that was about to be arrested, that would seem like entrapment to me. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me that my child could go into a stall and have a police officer peering at him through a public stall because he's trying to entrap somebody else. Right. Like, the whole thing bothers me mm -hmm. on, on so many different levels. And, you know, it's funny because we just were at this point this weekend, too, because my son is 10 and I take him into the women's bathroom all the time. Okay. And But he looks older than 10 and mm -hmm. people have looked askance and mm -hmm. I have said, tough. Right. I just don't, I don't feel like I owe them an explanation. Right. Okay. Um, once when he was little, 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 I was in a stall and he was outside and he was looking underneath the stall because he didn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. He got confused about which stall because they were all close. And I'm talking he was three. He probably looked like he was five. And a woman in the stall saw him looking underneath the stall to see if it was my shoes and was furious with him and me. Mm. And so, A five-year-old. Okay. Well, and, I, and I had to explain to her. I said, you know, I, I, need to, right, I need to keep him safe. And so just this weekend, though, my husband has said, I don't think it's appropriate anymore for him to go in the bathroom okay. with you. Just this weekend for the first time, Time. We were someplace, and I sent him into the men's bathroom, mm -hmm. and I said, I will stand outside, and I need you to go in and count the whole time that you're in here. In oh, there. that's a good idea. I want to hear you counting. Just yell out while you're counting so mm -hmm. that I know that you're okay and that everything is... Because if you stop counting, I'm coming in. Right. Uh, and I'm sure that everybody thought we were crazy. Okay, well, that's a good thing to do, because I could hear, that would be a good thing for me to do, to hear Wyatt counting. But maybe, you know, some of you have tips on this. Yeah, like we, I'd love to know, because I didn't etiquette know. Etiquette for children yeah. on the spectrum, because it is something that I think we all fear sending our child into a public place. You yeah. don't know who might be in there. I'm not going to go into the men's restroom necessarily and check it out first. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it, it, it's a time when they're into going into puberty that you start to look at things different. And especially the men's room, because a lot of times there aren't stall doors. I know. There's lots I know. of gray area. Yeah, there are. Uh, interesting. Okay, so should we do this, uh, the Autism Daily Newscast story of yes, the day? Yes, go ahead. Okay, we have a new, uh, we're, we're working in conjunction with the Autism Daily Newscast, mm -hmm. so every day we feature a story from them. Uh, this story today I think is very exciting that you guys are all going to want to know about. The headline is new new research project to look at dynamics of why ASD children are more likely to be bullied. The story comes from Calgary, Canada. The University of Calgary's Applied Child Psychology program is looking for students age seven, excuse me, eight to 17 with high functioning ASD and their parents to participate in a project which will look at their experiences with bullying and social situations. Adam McCrimmon, an assistant professor, says, we want to get a little more information about how, when, and why children with ASD are bullied so we can try and figure out some specific things we might be able to do about it. October is National Bullying Month, Prevention Month in the U.S. A recent report from the Interactive Autism Network found that 63% of children with autism had been bullied over three times as much as those without the disorder. So far... No research has been conducted to determine key factors that make those on the autism spectrum more susceptible to bullying. Dr. Sequin Zhang, lead researcher on a study published in September by the University of Texas in Arlington, recommended that researchers better identify the bully victim dynamics in order to develop prevention strategies accordingly. That is exactly what this project plans to achieve. Uh, McCrimmon explained 
feelings. We want to see why it's happening now. And then we want to also hopefully follow some of these children for a couple of years and see what is the long-term impact. If you're interested in knowing more about this study or more stories in the news, you can visit autismdailynewscast.com to find okay. out more. Good. I hope okay. some of you will participate. Yeah. Uh, it's a very worthwhile venture. Great. Great. Thanks. Uh, do we want to cover another story? Yes, or should let's we take do one okay. more. Okay. Um, well, there were two that out of England that, that were quite briefly, uh, autism diagnoses level off in Britain after five-fold surge during the 1990s, which is interesting. So um, um, evidence suggest, well, first of all, the occurrence of autism in eight-year-olds reached a plateau in the early 2000s, remained steady through to, to throughout 2010, and they said the cause of the surge in the 1990s remains in large part a mystery. One explanation is that changes to the way autism was diagnosed captured more cases, but this is unlikely to explain the five-fold increase seen. Uh, in conclusion, the annual prevalence of clinically confirmed autism recorded by UK GPs remains steady for the seven-year period 24, 20, 2004 to 2010, and now it seems like it's leveling off. So um, they don't know why it's leveling off. Interesting. It or is why there was a surge. Right. It is a very interesting. We thing. don't know. It causes a lot and of different And then questions. another story out of Cambridge that I really liked because of the recommendation out of the study yeah. is that uh, research found that children with autism were seen as less friendly and trustworthy by their peers based solely on appearance. Um, this was in the journal Autism. Found youngsters were less positive toward children with autism for negative impressions after a 30-second encounter. Um, and what they suggested, though, after seeing that typically developing children believe youngsters with autism were less trustworthy, and they also did not want to play with them or be their friend based on a 30-second encounter, was that children with autism have a difficult time at school, and 40% of children report being bullied. It's important schools work with typically developing children to educate them about autism in order to break through the negative impressions that can be formed through a moment's contact. So rather than saying we need to change our kids, let's change the typical children to know what autism is and to recognize that just because a child doesn't make eye contact or doesn't have the same kinds of expressions that they are not necessarily someone that they don't want to be friendly towards and have a relationship with. And I, and I, I love that, going at it from that point of view. But I, I also think, what I'm always talking about what can we do to bully-proof our kids. Right. Tomorrow, we're going to have Rosalind Picard on the show. She is from the MIT Autism Communication Technology Initiative. Mm. And she did a TED talk where uh, they talked about one, they're using this new technology to help kids on the autism spectrum using a computer screen to be able to see when they're initiating contact with somebody when they've lost their interest and correct it and ah. get feedback on a screen about how interesting the other person is finding them and change their tactics. I think it's the things that they're doing, that's just one of the many things they're doing at MIT. It's fascinating. That's but great. She, she'll be with us okay. tomorrow. So Great. Very exciting. What time? <laughs> that will be at 1020 okay. Pacific Standard Time. All right, good. So, so uh, we're going to come back with Maria Paz, who is the public policy analyst at Center for Autism and Related Disorders, to talk about the uh, Hispanic community and autism. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Lisa Ackerman. Welcome back to another What's Left in Pushing Friendlings for Kids with Allergies. And what we're going to make today is a peace request. We got lots of emails, and I really appreciate all the feedback. A lot of folks have been asking about what pizza crust is yeast-free, no eggs, and uh, no gluten and all the other fun stuff. So we're going to take that challenge head on. And if anyone who likes New York type style thin crust pizza, oof, that's what we're going for today. We're going to start with one and a half cups of almond flour. Now for folks who have allergies with nuts, there's a great um, bread pizza crust mix from Una's that I really like. 
it's another great alternative for people who are hoarding a lot of carbs and, and sugars. So I like this one as well. So Jamie's going to get the flaxseed meal going. And now let's talk about the starches. What's really important about this recipe to get that crisp New York style pizza crust is arrowroot. I love arrowroot starch. It has a lot to offer for binding and pulling this recipe together. And I also have my coconut oil. I'm a big fan of coconut oil. You've heard me talk about that many times. Next, we're going to add in our, um, our spices. I like a little spicy. If you've got a kid that doesn't like spices, it's okay. But I've gone really light in the oregano and basil. So we're going to go ahead that and add that in. Here's your baking soda. And for folks who like a little sweetness, I do like maple syrup a lot. But you can just add just a wee bit for flavor. I use typically maybe a half a teaspoon. So what's great about what Jamie's helping me with now, it's great for kids that have um, digestive issues. It gives a, a great deal of fiber and also allows a binding, um, like what you would look for in a gluten flour. This is um, a great gluten-free option. And this is a modified recipe from the website Real Sustenance. I love those guys. They do a great job, but I always like to create things. I appreciate them. Shout out. So we're ready to roll out our pizza crust. I'm so excited, Jamie. This tastes really good. We're going to get the pizza crust going and the pizza toppings ready <coughs> as well. So all I'm doing with the pizza crust is laying down some of my great parchment, um, unbleached parchment paper. And steal your husband with the rolling pin. That's always good times. So we're just going to real simply roll this thing out. They want it, you really want it to be as thin as possible. And it, it's really all a matter of preference as to how thin you want it to be. This is not a really good thick crust. So that looks good. So I'm just going to go and, and outline my pizza crust so it, it's going to look a little prettier when I take it out of the oven. So don't be afraid of the rolling pin. Your husband can be afraid of the rolling pin, but you don't need to be afraid. This is why you got to love parchment paper. And here we go. We're going to pre-cook this at 350 for about 22 minutes. Look at this pizza crust. It's not totally cooked yet. So that's okay because we're going to add our toppings to this. Most of us have a can of organic tomato sauce in our pantry. So all I'm doing is adding in just a smidge, let's say a quarter teaspoon of oregano. A smidge doesn't work in measurement. A quarter teaspoon of basil. And a wee bit of salt. Okay, a quarter teaspoon of salt. And for, for kids who are really sensitive to tomatoes, this is great because you can make it as fine as you want it to be. Not quite. That's not good. So if you want to cheat, you can use this um, puree. I like to take the roasted tomatoes, which is great. I'm going to put this around on my pizza crust. I know you have fingers. That's the only way to make pizza. I don't know. Made with love. <laughs> Kids love helping to make pizza, too, because they feel really involved in it. And they get to put however much they want of things. So yeah. good family affair. And we love the day of cheese. It goes on pretty much almost everything in my house. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add the day of cheese here. Too much cheese um, makes it a little soggy. So you may want to cook it a little longer and have it get a little bubblier. Um, we're also using some organic sausage. This is the sweet Italian sausage, and the more, the better. And then we're going to add our sliced back olives. Uh, I love olives, but again, if you've got a kid that likes pepperoni, there's eight nicely free pepperoni from uh, Borders Hill. There's our pizza, ready to go in the oven. I'm ready. Let's do this. Our pizza's in the oven at 400 degrees. You can go anywhere from about 25 to 30 minutes, but again, you really want it bubbly and cooked. If you put it at a higher temperature, the fake cheese doesn't like that and it can scald. Your kid's going to love you for such a great pizza. We'll see you next time on What's Left. If you have any questions, please email us at autismlive at gmail.com or you can hit facebook.com slash autismlive or go to the TACA website at TACA now, T-A-C-A-N-O-W. There's thousands of recipes waiting for you to enjoy. We'll see you next time. 
at Autism Live. What's more? You say howdy, we say hi. Let's get loud, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, let's get wild. We're back with Let's Talk Autism, and we are joined now by Maria Paz. Hi, Maria. Hi, thanks for having me. Thank you for being so good here. To have you. And Maria, you and I know each other because we've done some work together in the past, and now you have joined Center for Autism and Related Disorder as a public policy analyst. Yes. Tell us about that role. So um, I was first at the Capitol, like you know, and now I'm with the under with working with Julie Kornack um, on you know, legislative um, issues in not only in California but throughout the country and following very closely some of the mandates that are going on. Very important work. Yeah, okay. But Maria, tell us a little bit about what some of the biggest issues are for our Hispanic autism community. I think a lot of it has to do with the lack of um, awareness of the resources that are out there. I don't think it's a lack of resources, it's a lot more of um, educating our parents as well as educators and even members that are in leadership roles. Um, also um, being able to communicate with the parents and also so they are aware that when they see something that it's different about their child that they can access services. Um, what happens in the Latino community that a lot of them think that it's normal for boys to act a certain way as opposed to other non-Latino um, families that are a little bit more aware of the symptoms and all of that. So okay. um, that's one of the issues. And the problem with that is that they're being diagnosed at a later age than the non-Latino um, peers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, what ways do you think we can empower the Latino community to help them become aware earlier? I think, um, like I mentioned, educating um, the parents, but also the people that are working with them, and also um, giving them information in their own language and creating that, um, just creating that facility for them mm -hmm. as as to you know they can communicate and feel comfortable reaching out to to their pediatricians, to healthcare, and even. Um, centers like you know, uh, ours. Okay, so so educating them in their language, mm -hmm. having the pediatricians educated on the topic, and having centers that are available with Spanish-speaking coordinators and workers that can communicate with them in their yes. language are ways that we could yes. empower them. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the work you've done uh, with ACT Today and CART and some of the work you'll be doing in the future. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions, or simply type in a keyword find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step three, choose activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, 
and edit an activity's status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The skills language curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We are in the studio live with a very special guest, Maria Paz. She is a newly hired public policy analyst here at the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. Uh, but the fact that she looks so young, do not be mistaken, <laughs> this young woman has a great deal of experience. Yes. In fact, you have come to the Center for Autism and Related Disorders after working with in Sacramento with Assemblymember Perez, mm -hmm. who's been at the forefront working very hard to make sure that legislation is passed for autism so tell us a little bit uh, some of your highlights of having worked at the Capitol for Assemblymember Perez. It was a great experience um, I got the chance to learn the legislative process from beginning to end we just recently two of our bills were signed um, that were sponsored by CARD and by ACT Today also it gave me um, just the um, an opportunity to work with issues that I'm very interested in and learn a lot more about them. Yeah, so the bills, which were the One Act Today sponsored, was AB 1232. Can you explain to us, Maria, what that achieved? Yes, that was um, authored by Assemblymember Manuel Perez, and it adds a new quality assurance measure to ensure that services provided by the state's regional centers are provided in a linguistically and culturally matter manner. Uh -huh. So. Um, this is particularly interesting just because two-thirds of the individuals coming into our regional centers are diagnosed with autism. And a lot of, and just the increase of like, the Latino population and being that um, Latino children are the largest minority group. Um, so it's, that's a very important measure that was just signed by Governor Brown, as well as um, 367, uh -huh. SB 367 by Senator Block, that's another, that was sponsored by Center for Autism and Related Disorders and um, requires that the regional centers um, provide training for their board members on also the issues of culturally linguistic um, services. Okay, great. So, so the governor just signed those. Yes. Uh, into law, mm -hmm. and exciting. we should start seeing some results from that. January 1st. Okay, great. Really great. Remarkable. And um, I mentioned that ACT Today also has a program, ACT Espanol, and if you go to our website, act-today.org, you can see that tab, and you'll be able to access a series of videos with our spokesperson, uh, Gabriela Tessier, who is a, an autism mom, uh, Spanish-speaking, bilingual, uh, anchor at Univision, and Dr. Evelyn Garcia, um, who was our uh, ACT Espanol consultant. Dr. Evelyn has moved on, I believe, out of Center for Autism, but still working with us. So please uh, take a moment to look at that if you're interested. And, um, and share. If you and know share. families yes. that need that information, Definitely. really important to share yes, that. Yes, yes. And we do have a Spanish-speaking um, coordinator at ACT Today that if you would like to apply for a grant and you need assistance, uh, you can call us. Our number is on the website. And you can call us and you can speak to Carla Najera, and she'll be happy to speak with you in Spanish and help you. Um, now, Maria, you've got a conference that you wanted to tell us about as well. Is that yes, right? we're being, um, we were invited to a conference in downtown Los Angeles and it's um, done by Fiesta Educativa and the Mexican Consulate. So um, that will be on Friday. At, I think it begins at 9 a.m. 
Um, you can find that information on fiestaeducativa.com. Okay. It's a great conference. It's a Spanish conference for right. parents. And All right. So they can really go good. to, you can go to uh, Fiesta Educativa dot org fiesta educativa dot org and the conference is free but individuals must register due to limited capacity mm -hmm. okay all right and you will be there yes you'll be there. We'll be there okay card will be there yes all right great great so we hope that you'll take advantage of this um, if you are uh, a Spanish-speaking uh, family, if you have a child um, that you have questions about or is on the spectrum, to learn more uh, and take advantage of this great resource. So um, thank you, Maria, for joining no, us thank today. Thank you. And, and, I, and, and, and as we wrap up, I want to take a moment, too, to say how remarkable it is that you have so many different uh, pamphlets for ACT Today that you have taken the time to translate and yes, put into... Yes, we do. To, to, we have some pamphlets. Spanish. That's available now, and Center for Autism and Related Disorder yes. also mm -hmm. has pamphlets, which now we're going to have made available to ACT Today as well, uh, courtesy of CARD. So. And, and I think it's important. You and I know what we went through when our child was being diagnosed, mm -hmm. and we are two very capable women who yes. are outspoken and articulate and right. well-read right. and, and feel empowered usually on a daily basis, and we were leveled. Right. I can't we were. imagine what it would be like for someone who didn't have the benefit of being able to speak the language of the person they were talking to. I can't either. Um, you know, I, I often uh, remind myself and uh, we talk about the fact that I never heard the words ABA or the letters ABA or the words applied behavioral analysis until my son was four years old. And here I thought I knew everything. Right. <laughs> no, the Obviously Center for didn't. Autism is making sure we're working really hard to translate all of our resources into um, Spanish. Right. But I want to say to everyone who's listening and watching, if you, I know that in your life you come across people who ask you questions. And if you have had families that have you come across that they need some extra support, um, and they need things translated into, make sure you share that information. Mm -hmm. Very we important. We all have that responsibility. We do. We do. Okay. Well, Remarkable thank you, Remarkable to have you here. Yes. Thank you. So Thanks thrilled for having me. You. Thanks, Ria. All right. We're going to take a break and come back for more of Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Stick with us. When you find out you're having a boy, you always think, like, oh, he's going to play football. He's going to do this and that. And then when he's diagnosed... All those things get washed away. It's like that piece that's always in the back of your mind, you know? Where is he? What is he doing? Is he safe? We really didn't know what we were dealing with. I wish that they could have directed me a little bit more and provided me some information. I was a young mom. I didn't know what it was like to raise a boy despite a boy with autism. Hundreds of thousands of families are not getting the help they need for their children with autism all around the country. Act today is determined to bridge the gap. These families really have to go through a lot to get a grant. The application process isn't easy. The records, the diagnosis proof, they're really battling for their kids. So when we can give them a grant, it is so wonderful to see that they succeed in getting that help for their children. Our founder, Dr. Doreen Grampache, is an amazing woman and she is one of the world's foremost authority on behavior of children with autism. She's extremely knowledgeable and she oversees every single grant we give. She is part of that process. People may think of autism care and treatment as simply schooling or therapy. But, you know, we provide important safety supports, things like fencing, for example. The whole family's living in fear of that child running out into traffic. I recently delivered an iPad to a little boy with some of the apps that are out there for children with autism. Miracles happen. I got the iPad for an act. From Act. What yes. did it say? Can you repeat that, Dustin? I got the iPad from Act. We have helped so many military families. And when I think of these brave families that are fighting two battles, one to protect our country and one for the right treatment and care for their children, it, it breaks my heart. And I think we have to do more as a nation to help them. There's not a day that doesn't go by that we don't think about it. Some people say, oh, he's normal. 
you don't see the battles that I see every single day. My husband does have to deploy, and when they get on that bus, that might be the last time that my kids ever see them. So I called, and they informed me that he had received the grant, which was like a blessing from above. I was just like speechless. I just started to cry because, you know, without it, we would, we would have been lost. The AT grant was a total miracle. and Without that, they wouldn't be able to receive a service dog. So we're so appreciated what they've done for us as a family. Recently, ACT Today funded a program for military children with autism in San Diego, the Inclusion Films Program, which is run by Joey Travolta and teaches uh, kids on the autism spectrum literal filmmaking skills. They learn how to make a movie. Are we ready? There you go, got it. Okay. Everything that goes into the process of making a film goes into everyday life. So they're learning life skills, they're learning to collaborate. It was really nice to know how much they were enjoying this camp. And they're with people who are supporting them and are making them feel great about themselves and their differences and their similarities. And I get two kids that are working together and apart and together and apart. So it's an interrelationship as well as a camp and a learning experience. It's so fulfilling when I get letters. One stands out for me, a, a boy who was 14 with Asperger's, and we gave him a grant to go to a drama camp. He wrote to us and said, Dear Act Today, thank you for letting me belong for the first time in my life. These kids are remarkable. You know, we underestimate them. They're so knowledgeable, they're so capable, and we can change the life of a family, which means changing the life of a community. Welcome back to Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Nancy and I were just talking about the fact that uh, they still have not been able to locate and find Avante, uh, the 14-year-old who went missing, uh, it's two and a half, almost three weeks ago mm. now, from his school, escaped from his aid. They have no leads, no whereabouts. The reward has been up to $85,000 uh, for his any information that leads to them finding him. Of course, the family is afraid at this point that he has been abducted and his brother is asking that people not give up that they continue mm -hmm. the search the fear mm -hmm. at this point is that at some point they will stop searching and I know that's unthinkable to all of us who have children on the spectrum um, just absolutely devastating and we we hear that according to the Daily Mail the police have even reached out to psychics that they feel like it's just a dead end they have no I, I keep wondering with all of the cameras in New York City mm -hmm. they have no footage of this young man leaving the school entering yeah, the subway going anywhere that's now the aid can you refresh me I think you know yes. a little bit more about the details of this than I do was the aide with him at the time and he bolted or I he not with him at the I, time. I don't know that we have heard exactly what the aid story is, but the aid is a one-on-one -on -one aid. This young man was never to be left alone. So if the aid wasn't there, then the question would be why. But this was the fourth time that this child, this young man, had eloped, had been able to elude the aid and leave the school premises. The okay. other three times they found him in the subway, which is why they scoured the subways looking for him. And they have had scuba divers uh, dive in the river to see, you know, um, but, you know, for me, the devastating thing about this is our, we know our kids elope, right? We mm -hmm. know that the, the vast majority of them yes. elope. And, and here is a young man that this school knew eloped, and he had been able to do it three times before. And, and my big question is, so what were you doing about that? Yeah, so what were you doing about it? Because obviously whatever it was wasn't enough. Right. Well, I have to, you know, in in uh, empathy uh, with parents who have children that elope, yes. because my son uh, did go through this uh, for a period of time, probably between the ages of three to seven. 
uh, at which point we did start a program uh, with his ABA that clunk, there goes my headset, uh, <laughs> with his uh, ABA program, uh, and we told social stories. And he ended up writing his own story about a little monkey that escaped at the z uh, from his mom at the zoo and had to spend the night at the zoo, called Sammy Learns to Listen. And that really helped teach him not to run up ahead and let go of my hand. Uh, I had concerns for my son's safety at his public school. And the, one of the reasons was because a child on the spectrum was found walking home two miles from the school alone. He had left during recess and just started walking home. And one of my neighbors knew uh, he was on the autism spectrum, pulled over and said, what are you doing? He said, I'm walking home. <laughs> And she took him home, and his mother was horrified, and she yeah. took him back to school. Um, I also went to visit my son one day, and the special ed's teacher daughter was watching him on the play playground while he was, you know, hundreds of yards away from her just spinning around on a swing. So that was one of my... Um, one of our determinations to take him out of this public school because we requested a full-time non-public aid trained in ABA, which the district turned us down. So we had to go to a private school and provide our own aid. Right. So um, I was wondering whether safety it can be made an issue in a um, in an IEP. Absolutely, absolutely. And and before I uh, expound on that, I just want to clarify that when I said, you know, he had escaped three times before, and now it's the fourth time. You know, what what were you doing? It's not enough. I meant the school. The school. Because as a parent, you drop your child off at the school, and it is their responsibility. Mm -hmm. It is their responsibility. I mean, obviously, we have to advocate for our children, and we want to double check that they're doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. But it is the the school's responsibility to make sure that our kids are safe while they're there. Right. And part of, you know, when we talk about it, IEPs, the school has a responsibility to provide FAPE, a free appropriate public, public education, but they are supposed to teach our child relevant skills that are you know, they can they can amend it to make it work for them so that they don't necessarily have to be at the standards that the rest of the class are at, but they also have a responsibility to teach our children occupational skills so that they are productive moving on in life. Now, that's going to be different things for different kids, mm -hmm. but it's one of the reasons why we can ask for aids at lunchtime because they're working on social situations, mm -hmm. and safety is definitely included under that heading. Safety should be the most paramount that that should be guaranteed automatically, but it can be absolutely brought up in the IEP and written in different things to be able to maintain and That's teach goal. safety. Okay, you so this is something goals. that all parents should think about when yeah. formulating their IEPs, particularly if you have a child who elopes or wonders. Absolutely. Uh, that you make sure your child is safe when they are at that school. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times, right. a lot of times you can write it into the IEP, but even more impor important than that, so they're working on those safety skills. But from the beginning, while you're working on those safety skills, you have to have the BIP, the Behavior Intervention Plan. If you know that your child elopes, make sure that you have them do a BIP, a Behavior Intervention Plan that makes it possible for, makes it impossible for your child to elope and to get a paycheck for eloping. So that's really super duper important that there be a BIP attached to that IEP. Okay. Um, and that it address those things. And if the child is still eloping with a BIP in place, then the, the BIP has to be amended because mm -hmm. it's not working. Mm -hmm. So really important um, that if, if your child is ever engaged in that kind of behavior or any behavior that would lead them or anybody else to be unsafe, BIP. Right. And by the way, the skills program can help you with all of these things. If you go in, there's a whole safety, a set of safety lessons and skills. Okay. And so you can go to your IEP, pick out the ones based on the assessment that are appropriate for your child. You can print out the IEP language and say, I'd like this added to my child's IEP, mm -hmm. these safety lessons, and it'll be right there in IEP language okay and they have a BIP builder as part of skills so that you can go through either with the school or on your own and say here's the BIP that and it will walk you through all the different um, steps of it you can pretty much write the BIP yourself and take it in and say that's great I cool. want my staff my child staff 
trained in this and this is what I want to ensure that my child is safe. And I will say this too, that when it comes to safety, if you, if you push that issue with schools and make sure you have a tape recorder and that you put it in emails, they get really very uh, <laughs> concerned. Nervous. <laughs> they get nervous, concerned, and proactive. Right. Because bad enough if anything were ever to happen to sure. a child, but if something were to happen to a child and you had written emails mm -hmm. and said, I'm concerned and here's what I need you to do and they hadn't mm -hmm. done it, mm -hmm. yeah, they don't want that. Catastrophe for the school. For the school, as yes. it should be. As it should as be. As it should be. Yeah, keeping our children safe is the number one priority. But so don't be overwhelmed, though. If you need help with those things, you can find them all in skills. On skills. And it's very easy to use. Great. Very right. easy to use. Okay. So, um, well, speaking of IEPs, yes. how is Jim's, uh, we're almost at the end of the first quarter, are we yes. not? Okay, because I know that Wyatt has uh, parent-teacher, uh, we have meetings, and yeah. we just had our first IEP of the year at the private school we have him at, which yeah. is run by the Adventist Church, and we have his aid provided, our insurance Thankfully, yeah. uh, this year provided a full-time aid. Was we had to pay for that privately in the past there at the school. Um, so we're very fortunate to have that resource. Yeah. But because it is a uh, private school, we hired an educational consultant to come up with goals, yeah. and we convened our own IEP with his aides, with his supervisor, with his teacher, with the principal, mm -hmm. and we're doing what the public schools do by law. Right. So we just put together these goals and we're working on them now, so I'm hoping that we have a very productive year. Um, what about Jim? How is everything going with his goals? You know, it's IEP been an interesting year, year um, and we're, I, I usually like at this time of the year, I want to relax and everything's right. fine. Yes. And I've learned over the years, you really can't do that. No, no. You got to be on it and you got to. All gotta, the time. You, um, and we had a bumpy start mm -hmm. because he was in a classroom for two weeks and then um, in other grades, they moved the teachers around, so he got moved to a a grade that's just grade five, but his teacher got just a sixth grade. So he had to move classrooms, he had to move teachers, he had to mm. move peers. Dramatic. Uh, you know, like the uh, for me, the my worst case scenario. Right. Something I would have moved heaven and earth to make not happen. Yeah. If they had told me they were going to do that, I would have put them in a private school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, I don't know what I would have done money-wise, but I would have worked it out. Right. Right? You um, find ways to. So, and, and the new teacher is wonderful and uh -huh. she's fabulous, but it's still, we now have had a misstep in the beginning. We have a whole new set of rules and a whole new set of everything, and it's made it really, really difficult. And but my, is he adjusting? He is adjusting. Um, I, I would say that we've had a little bit of, uh, of difficulty in terms of he no longer has an aide in the classroom. Mm. There is no additional support in the classroom well, for him, right? you know what? And on the one hand, of course, congratulations, which right? means he's come very far. Right. And it's and it's miraculous and it's fabulous. But it does mean we have to have other things in place at other times mm -hmm. to make sure that everything is fine. Does he go uh, to special uh, special resource? He does not go to special resource. He he does quite well academically. He's fully included. He's he's fully included. He does get some speech and he gets an OT push in that somebody will come in 15 minutes a week, I mm -hmm. think, because his handwriting is really not where it needs mm -hmm, to be. Mm -hmm. um, and and this year, he has a recreational aid, though, that is just with him on the playground okay. to help him with social skills, because mm -hmm. that's where he is needing the help and mm -hmm, support. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that at different times of the day, it's just some different considerations. It's harder for me to know what homework, mm -hmm. because always before, there was at least someone, a teacher aide or someone who could be on him at the end of the day to make sure that he got it all written down in a right. way that mom could read it. Right. So we are having to put in other things. Yeah. We're still shoring up. Okay. It's all okay. Right. But it's energy, you yes. know. Yes, yeah. And well, one of the things that we uh, adapted this year was uh, because his school day is fairly long, he gets, you know, out at three, we have him do his school, his homework at school. Oh, yeah. Because what was happening for Wyatt was in the afternoons, we were spending an hour and a half on homework during his uh, what needed to be uh, adaptive skills with right. his behavior therapy. Yeah. And so it was eating up too much time because yeah. you don't want to have a child 
go to school all day, come home, have an ABA program from four to six, and then at six o'clock be starting homework. Yeah. So uh, we changed that this year. That's working out much better. But yet I feel a little out of the loop because I'm not maybe as diligent as I need to be about seeing what work he's doing. Isn't it funny you know? how we beat ourselves up about we, we can't be everywhere well, we at all? Can't. And I and, and I hear it because I, I go, oh, I don't know what's happening know, with this. And I know. And then you feel like that clock is always ticking. Yes. You know, the time goes by so fast. You want to take advantage of every second yeah. of every year of whatever resources you have, educational, yeah. behavioral, anything we might get yeah. uh, to help our children move Absolutely. along. Uh, because I, I can't believe why it's going to be 12 in November. I just, I cannot <sighs> believe it. It's the, the time, time has passed so quickly. Yeah. And, you know, maximizing these next six years to prepare him for whatever comes next. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we keep talking about that cliff that we hear so much about where uh, the support services uh, tend to dry up yeah. and parents talk about going off that cliff when the kids are 18. Yeah. So you and I are looking into some uh, guests coming up yes. um, that have uh, oh developed some programs that are real concrete programs. So uh, we hope to be featuring some of those. Yes. Uh, we actually have a, a gentleman uh, that we have contacted who is an entrepreneur his name i might mess up the name thorkill Sohn. Sohn. yes and this man is uh, attracting international attention for uh he runs a company called specialist stern i don't know if i'm pronouncing that right but he has come up with a program uh where he employs young people on the spectrum and has not only had them survive and thrive, he has had them excel to the degree that they are better employees productivity-wise than typical employees, and he is now bringing this program to the U.S. Uh, we're going to have him on the show, yes. and we're trying November to November 13th. That. November 13th. November so, 13th, he will be here during right. Let's Talk. Well, Fantastic. he'll be via Skype, so we're excited so to bring I, that to you. This is, this is one of the most phenomenal new developments I've read yep. of. He was in it's the New York exciting. Times Sunday Magazine. We did manage to, you tracked him down and yep. we're getting him on. So that'll be all coming up. All thanks to you. That's well, all. That's, well, it's very exciting. And I think exciting. that hopefully we can even maybe forge a partnership with him, uh, maybe to be a regular guest, maybe to have a program with Act Today or with Card. Uh, we'll look at love it. Love that. Uh, but we'll, you can see that on November 13th. Uh, we want to remind you that tomorrow we have a jam packed show. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have Rosalind Pincher, uh, who's going to be with us from MIT. Excellent. And so that's amazing. We also have people in. from the, the documentary, uh, What I Want to Say. I Want okay. to Say. Really amazing. I'll tune in. Uh, so lots of things going on. Okay. Well, we're, we're at the end of the show. We are at the sh end of the show. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. And give yourselves a hug from me. Bye-bye for now. Bye.